So welcome to the video version of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, the podcast version for July 1st. I'm Sven Hosford, the managing editor, and our podcast and our print and web uh, efforts are all designed to be a collaboration of journalists as well as integrative medicine professionals in Western Pennsylvania. So we have a new uh, copy of our magazine. The summer issue has been out on the street for about a, a month or so. Uh, we have a map up on our website if you want to take a look at where to find it. And uh, I do want to just take a quick aside to say whoever sent the copy to Joyce, you hand wrote Joyce's address on there, and then you put it in the mail. You didn't get the postage on there. I, I got the postage, so Joyce will be getting her copy a little late. I have no idea who sent that, but that was kind of fun. So uh, a lot of very enthusiastic people out sharing the print version of the journal, and I really do appreciate that. Uh, so you can catch us every week on iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, YouTube, and of course on the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. So uh, this hour, got a really special guest, uh, somebody I've known a long time, very much fun to interview, let me tell you. We'll be talking with Patricia Lemmer. She is the author of Envisioning a Bright Future, Interventions that Work for Children and Adults with Autism Spectrum Disorder. That was a 2008 release. And now her new book, Outsmarting Autism, The Ultimate Guide to Management, Healing, and Prevention, uh, is out in Kindle and will soon be out uh, in print. She is the founder also of the Developmental Delay Resources, which is a network, a resource network for professionals and parents of special needs. And then coming up later in the hour, we're gonna have a little video visit from uh, our new friend, Joe Venari of Fitzburg. He had a little fun down at Market Square today. We'll uh, check in with him. So the first thing we like to do every podcast is check up with the calendar of what's happening in uh, Western Pennsylvania in relation to uh, lifestyle medicine and integrative medicine. So coming up uh, in July, there's a few things happening. Uh, Jim Donovan is going to be at the Pittsburgh Shambhala Center on Highland Avenue. If you've never been through a Jim Donovan workshop, you really need to do this. One of the most fun things you will ever do. Um, and especially if you've never thought about drumming or never wanted to be a drummer, it's a, it's a great fun. July 20th, David Newman, also known as Durga Das, is going to be at the Union Project. Again, this is a, a sort of a yoga thing. It's a call and retreat. It's sort of participatory. You don't just sit there. You actually are a part of the concert. It's a whole lot of fun. And that's at the, uh, the Union Project. Great uh, uh, place over there in uh, uh, Highland Park, I think that's where that is. Also coming up at the end of the month, uh, July 26th, is the World Magazine Yoga Fest. Coming up again at Point State Park. Uh, nothing better than doing yoga out in the sun, in the grass. If you can be out there that Saturday, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, August 2nd, uh, don't have any great amount of details for you just yet, but there's uh, going to be a, a Seclair retreat at the Tranquility Gardens in Johnstown. So if you are interested in uh, having a picnic up in the mountains and having some networking time with uh, other integrative medicine professionals, put August 2nd on your calendar and we'll get some more details for you coming up soon. Uh, also at St. Clair, uh, which is the Behavioral uh, Wellness Lifestyle Medicine Center out in Export, uh, on August 6th, Dr. Uma will be speaking um, on quantum wellness. Uh, she is really a fun and dynamic speaker, and uh, her she has a, a, an article in this print issue of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine. So that's August 6th at St. Clair. All the details are up on the St. Clair website. Another uh, save the date, not a lot of details yet, but August 16th. Uh, is going to be the Organically Social Wellness Expo at the Pittsburgh Public Market all day uh, with all of his new organic social, organically social members uh, and a great lot of fun down in the Strip District on a Saturday. So uh, we'll have a lot more things coming up as they develop, but uh, if you're in the massage profession or the hands-on profession of any kind and you want to update your CEs for your two year, uh, for a two year period actually, you get enough for two years. It's the fall conference for massage at Seven Springs Resort put on by the Pittsburgh School of Massage Therapy. That happens November 2nd and 4th. And uh, I understand that Dean Juhan uh, is just the man when it comes to the Traeger principles. And he's gonna be there doing work with the shoulder girdle, the pelvic girdle, and the spine and the torso. 
if you are a massage therapist, this is a really good opportunity. So you want to find out more about that on our website and at the Pittsburgh School of Massage website. So that's it for the calendar this week. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the upcoming event with Organically Social. So let's check in with our sponsor, Organically Social. Today I ran into Trenton at the uh, pop-up wellness fair down on Market Square. Let's check in with Trenton. <laughs> So here we are with this week's update from Trenton Ozzypuck from Organically Social. What's happening this week in OS? Busy, busy. So tomorrow, the 2nd of July, we start our card sales for our pre-sale. So anyone that's eager that really wants to make sure they get one of their first card holders, we're giving it as a 30% off discount for the entire year. So only $17.49 for your 12-month membership. Um, we're giving that to the first 100 card holders. So go online to getorganicallysocial.com tonight at 12 midnight uh, to get your, your card. Uh, we'll be, again, doing that for the first 100, and then once that's over, we'll have back up to $24.99, which still is so, so reasonable. So well, Most people will see this till tomorrow. So. Yeah. So get, get online as soon well, as you Well, go online too. tonight then. <laughs> go online right now. Yeah. So go online now. Um, you're watching this previously, so we're filming it at uh, the Get Fit PGH or Pittsburgh uh, Pop-Up Health and Wellness Fair today. Um, plenty of things going on, staying warm, sweating a little bit at the same time, but uh, mingling with other vendors, it's a great time. Thanks so much, Trent. Thank you. So we're back, and our guest uh, on this podcast is Patricia S. Lemmer. She is a licensed professional counselor with over 40 years' experience advocating for families of children with special needs. She is passionate about determining underlying causes of developmental delays and not just treating the symptoms. She discourages labeling and specializes in combining developmentally appropriate practice with sound theory. Ms. Lemmer is the co-founder of the nonprofit Developmental Delay Resources and is the board chair of Epidemic Answers. Her previous book, Envisioning a Bright Future, was published in 2008, and her new book, Outsmarting Autism, is out on Kindle and will be out in print in September. Do I have all of that right, Patty? You're, you did your homework. I'm impressed. <laughs> Thanks. Well, and truth be told, Patty and I have been uh, friends of, and colleagues or known each other for uh, uh, at least one of the four decades you've been in practice, I think. And uh, I've always known you to be a straight shooter, and I'm real excited uh, for your new book. And real, uh, I wanted to have you on for a couple of reasons. Um, I, I think you had told me that between 2008 and this new book, uh, almost everything you know about autism has changed or is new and revolutionary. Is that about right? Well, I wouldn't say everything has changed, but there's a lot of new developments okay. that have proven some of the things we only were able to hypothesize about in the past. That's right. Okay. What? Give us a couple of examples of things you can now prove. Well, we now know that kids with autism are different, made up differently biologically. And we thought that was true by their reactions to foods and to environmental toxins, but now we know that they have some genetic susceptibility to these environmental triggers, and that um, since the Genome Project, we are able to identify specific genes. Um, these genes are called SNPs for single nucleotide proteins, hmm. and these SNPs have problems that make them have these kids and their their families have difficulty detoxifying. So if these toxins hurt people and they hurt everybody, then everybody would be autistic, but they don't. They just hurt the people who are unable to get rid of the toxins. Okay, so two things I want to make sure I heard clear is, uh, one, we now know which, which of the SNPs which yeah. are the, the problem and lead to the susceptibility for autism. Correct. It, does, that, does that mean there's a test for it now, or there could be a test? There is a test, there actually. Is a test. Okay. You can, have, you can have your genes mapped. And Angelina Jolie was one of the first people that told us about that when, when she had this genetic testing. And then, unfortunately, she didn't talk to the right people, so she lopped off her breasts. 
right. instead of talking to people who could tell her how to fix these genes. Just because you have the gene is only half the problem. The second half is that you have to be exposed to an environmental trigger which turns the gene on. Well, that, and yeah. this is called epigenetics. epigenetics. And the word epigenetics wasn't even in existence when I wrote my other book in 2008. Well, that's really interesting, and I know that's the work uh, largely based on uh, Bruce Lipton and the biology of belief and, and that sort of yeah. thing. And now, well, Bruce Lipton is he's he is takes advantage of this, but he also is not only talking about tangible toxins such as in the air and food and water, but he's also talking about intangibles such as your belief system and negative beliefs that, that affect your ability to detoxify. So if okay. the doctor says, oh, you're going to die in six months, this is the worst case of this I've ever seen, or your child has the worst case of autism, your genes and your nervous system and your immune system hear that and respond negatively to that energy of what he's saying. Well, the other, the other point I want to make sure I hear clearly is that the, the, the defective gene or, or, or the effects of the, deject, the defective gene is that your, your body is less able or unable to detoxify? That's uh, correct. In, in so what, go ahead. Detoxification is like it occurs in two cycles, just like your washing machine. So there's methylation and then there's sulfation. And the methylation cycle allows the toxins to, to be released from where they're hiding in the body. And then the sulfation cycle allows your body to release them through one of your excretory functions, whether you poop or, or urinate or sweat it out or it comes out your hair. And so a majority of kids who we've tested have problems with either one of the methylation genes or one of the sulfation genes and you'll be into your listeners and you'll be interested to know that the, the methylation gene is um, keep these five letters in your mind's eye it's one of the M T H F R genes and that's the M stands for methyl methylation methyl tetrahydrate Folic redux haze. Yeah, that's easy for and, you to say. Yeah. Well, it's it took me a long time to be able to remember <laughs> it, but if you keep those MTHFR letters in your mind's eye and you add some vowels to it, right, you get a not very pretty word that I don't know if you're going to allow me to say on the air. Well, I was going to say mother father, but uh, I don't know where you well, were going. Mother something else, sir. <laughs> So the, the mothers in this, in the <laughs> autism community, call this... The MF gene, right? What? The MF gene. The gene that screws you up. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay? And that gene disallows you from methylating. Right. And then the sulfation gene that many of them have is called the SUOX gene, S-U-O-X, and that's a sulfation gene. And so that's the bad news. But the good news is that we can supplement these kids and their families with nutritional supplements that encourage methylation and sulfation and help them detoxify. And we can also educate them in ways that they can avoid the toxins by greening their homes and using products that are not toxic and eating foods that don't have toxins in them so sure. that they're not adding further to their toxic load. Well, this is, uh, I think what you're giving us in, in one sense is really good news. So are you able to say now, and, and let's, I, I'm assuming that with this book, you've done a lot of research and you've talked to the research scientists now. So can you say that it is the toxins in our environment, period, that causes uh, this whole spectrum of disorder. Yes, it's the genes which allow these toxins in, but if, as you're saying now, if we know that it's toxins that cause it, 
we can prevent uh, or, or teach you ways to prevent those toxins from getting into your system and then add supplementation to get the this stuff out of your system. By and large, can we get a handle on autism then? We can, but toxins are not the only problem. And so the second chapter of my book is called Total Load Theory. Yeah. And total load theory is how all different kinds of, quote, toxins, unquote, accumulate. And there are five or six or eight kinds of toxins. And as we talked about with Bruce Lipton, toxins are not always tangible. Right. They could be the tangible toxins like mercury and formaldehyde and MSG that are in your food and environment. But they could also be toxic people and abuse. They could also be toxic medical procedures like cesarean section and putting tubes in a kid's ears. And they could also be toxic practices that um, are traumatic um, and not good for babies, like having them sleep on their backs, mm. which are not quote, toxic, unquote, but are all stressors to the developing nervous system. Is that a better word, so stressors? Stressors stress, a better word? Stressors, yeah. Yeah. So I have six categories of stress that I talk about in my book, and environmental stressors and biological stressors, environmental stressors are only a couple of them. We also have school stressors, academic stressors, where kids are pushed ahead um, prematurely to do academics that they're not ready for. No. We have um, psychological stressors of kids who are um, forced to sit still and pay attention. We have sensory stressors. I was going to say, how does that, what, how, how is that lack of exercise? How is that a stressor? How is that categorized? That's an absolute stressor because no. ec movement is – is food for the nervous system. Oh, Your I like body that. not only needs tangible food that we get with our fruits and vegetables, but it also needs to move. So kids who are too sedentary and don't get to move and all these contraptions that we get for our babies like bumbo chairs and, and car seats and backpacks and things that restrict their movement, those are all stressors for the reflexes in the body to emerge and develop. And so what we see with a lot of these kids is the majority of them are clumsy, some of them are toe walkers, some of them haven't developed a dominant side of their body, wow. some of them have eyes and hands that don't work together and visual issues, some of them have what's called a strabismus, which is a turned eye. So it's extremely complicated for the brain and the body to process everything that it has to process and come out with a normal kid, it's really amazing that anybody comes out normal. Well, especially in today's world. Uh, I mean, especially in today's world. Yeah, <laughs> even in uh, you know, I grew up in the '60s and went to high school in the '70s, and even then, it was you know, pretty ridiculously stressful. And, and the kids today, it's just, it's just. Well, nuts. the stressors are different now. I mean, you and I are both grandparents, and, you know, our kids' lives are very different. Our grandkids' lives are very different than their parents' lives were, yeah. and they're very different than our lives were. You know, we played outside freely in the woods. Right. We came home when the street lights came on, and kids are not allowed to do that today. We have safety issues, and we, we don't have the same kind of freedom of movement. Kids are not... Um, making up games and having free play and making forts in the woods. Their their world is not three-dimensional anymore. It's more two-dimensional. Mm. I saw an article that called our generation the two-screen generation and our kids' generation the three-screen gener. Our parents were two-screen. We were three-screen. Our kids are four-screen. And today's kids are five-screen generation. So what does that mean? So, they can look at five screens at once, or that's what they have well, five screens in their Well, they have five sc options to look at screens. They have computers, televisions, te iPhones, tablets. Yeah. <laughs> they have all these different screens that take their attention and 
in which things are presented in two dimensions, which the brain and the, and the eyes are not developed to visual, well, visually see two dimensions. Our mm. brain wants to see three dimensions. What, uh, um, if you were to wave a magic wand, what would be the age you would allow kids to start watching, uh, start using video games and, and be on the computer? What do you think is a safe age? Basically. I would say developmentally seven or eight. Okay. And that doesn't mean chronologically. I want them to be, to have very good eye-hand coordination and have the, the ability to read and good body eye-hand and body eye coordination to be able no. to kick and throw a ball to be able to ride a bike to be able to swim and our kids can't even what we're seeing today is and you ask any kindergarten teacher they're they're seeing kids with very weak hands hmm. because these kids have had no time on their tummy they're in these 45 degree angles in these seats and these floppy hands are not getting the pressure that kids used to get by pushing down. So fast forward to kindergarten, they can't hold a pen, a pencil, they can't cut with scissors, they, wow. they know how to use a mouse and a touch screen, but they can't, can't hold anything. And so their hands are need to be trained. Wow. It's it's a it's a crazy crazy world, yeah. and now they're stopping teaching handwriting because they're saying kids don't need to learn how to handwrite. They just use touch screens and and shorthand on a on a screen. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> and handwriting is not about writing. It's right. it's a brain integration process. It's integrating the left and the right hemispheres of the brain to be able to integrate language and visualization. And that's what most of our kids are missing today. And the GPS is another thing that's interfering with that. Kids are not moving through space. They don't know where they are. Their parents don't know where they are. So their parents use the GPS to go a mile from their home because they don't know the way. Yeah, yeah. And so it's it's going to be really interesting. You and I aren't going to be here to see it, but really? <laughs> we're going to have a lot of lost people. Well, this, 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 I mean, we could talk about this for a, a long time on a lot of different subjects. I did want to just go uh, take a step back for just a second and uh, give you a chance to tell us a little bit about how you got into this, why you got into this, why did you found this organization, uh, and, and you know what, what have you accomplished here in the last few years? Well, I got into this by accident. I was a, a, a counselor, and I was doing play therapy in the late 60s, early 70s with kids with issues. There, were no, there was no um, autism back then. There were kids who'd had accidents and fallen out of trees, and there were kids who had seizure disorders and kids who we called retarded, but we don't use that term anymore, Especially and kids that, with yeah. cerebral palsy as a result of birth accidents. And I wanted to know what helped these kids, what, what were the causes of these, and not just treat them palliatively. I didn't want to mask the symptoms. And so, as you know, I've always been a heretic. <laughs> and so in the 70s, it was about learning disabilities. And in the 80s, it was more about attention deficit disorder. Right. And in the 90s, eight, late 80s, early 90s, it became autism. And because I'd seen a couple of these kids and nobody else had seen any of them, I was an instant expert. Yeah, of course. But, but I want to get back to the, to the treatments of them. Yes. Because I think it's important. That's what this book is it's a manual for looking at treatments well and yeah, I, in my book i have five steps right let's talk about those okay and germane to what we were talking about a few minutes ago the very first step is a lifestyle change right and it's not running off to the speech pathologist and hoping that your insurance is going to cover that the very first step is to start eating real food <laughs> and to stop eating out, especially in fast food restaurants where you don't know what you're getting and where there's a lot of artificial colors and flavors and preservatives and sugar. 
What are, are those? The, those are the key triggers that you found sugar those preservatives. Are the main triggers of neurological problems with kids. Okay. And so, most most today's mothers don't cook. Most families eat a meal or two a week at home, and they say, well, we eat together, we eat in the car on the way to soccer practice. And that's not the same as sitting down at a table and eating something that somebody cooked from scratch and that you have to sit still and pay attention and wait your turn and, and wait till everybody's finished before you have dessert. And so that's that one kindergarten teacher said to me, that should be a prerequisite to going to kindergarten, is to being able to sit through 10 minutes of a meal. And we take these kids and put them in circle time in kindergarten, and none of them can sit still because they've never had to sit still at, at home for, for a meal. Well, and so with too much sugar I want to work on what they're eating. I want to work on what they're drinking, getting rid of the sodas. Right. I want to work on what they're breathing to open the windows and turn off the air conditioning and send them outside. And I want to work on how much they're sleeping. And these are main issues. And in fact, I think we can get about 80% improvement Is that in right? our kids by changing their diet and their exercise and their movement and their sleep patterns. Real eighty percent. Trying to get parents to do that is really where I I want to focus. Wow, now that's really interesting because um, many sources say that um, eighty percent of all diseases are caused by lifestyle choices, and now you're saying eighty percent of autism. This is no different. Autism is yeah, no different. That's really amazing. So just with yeah. diet. Uh, with uh, breathing, with sleeping, with exercise, and yeah. watching the toxins and, and, and the clothing. And, and watching, watching the amount of, of video stuff right? and screen time, screen time and electromagnetic fields. All of these, these electronic devices put off invisible radiation that aggravates our nervous system. So people have... Many kids go to bed with a, an electronic toy, and this aggravates their nervous system during the night. Many people who have trouble sleeping have a phone, a walk-around phone next to their bed, which is broadcasting into their head all night long. They have plasma televisions in the bedroom, which are broadcasting. And these are affecting not only our brains and our, as part of our nervous system, but our whole nervous system. And furthermore, many of these kids have bugs. They have parasites. They have mm. bacteria, wow. which are um, living in their guts, which is the, the, the beginning of their problem. And this is another word that didn't exist when I started, when I wrote that other book, which was the biogenome. Right. This is the, the living organisms that are in our gut. And we carry around a couple pounds of organisms in our in our gut, and we want them to be good bugs. We want them to be like the praying mantises and the snails in the garden. We don't want them to be bad bugs. Right. And many of our kids carry around bad bugs that make toxins, which are more toxic to their bodies. And so when you have electromagnetic fields in your environment, they aggravate the bugs, too. The bugs don't like those any more than our nervous system does, so the bugs put out more toxins. Wow. So you have a combination of what's a perfect storm in your body. You have, infl you have bugs in, the, in, your, in your gut, and you have inflammation, and you have toxins like mercury. And they, that le allows the bugs to live happily ever after. So when you treat these kids, you have to treat all three things simultaneously. Mm. You've got to kill the bugs. You've got to, to, to temper the inflammation. And you've got to get rid of the toxins and stop the exposures. And it's very complicated. And 
You can't do it by yourself. You've got to work with a very talented med medical professional, not necessarily a doctor. It could be a nutritionist. It could be a naturopath. It could be a health coach. But it needs to be somebody who understands the relationship between the gut and the brain. Great. Because yeah. Gut is considered to be the second brain. Michael Gershon wrote that book years ago called The Second Brain, and that's a book about the gut. Yeah. And so parents will tell you, well, he had diarrhea, constipation, one or the other or both alternating for many, many months before he was diagnosed with autism. Uh, we see that over and over and over again. And that's true of other diseases, too. So step one is the lifestyle changes. Did, what, did we go through step the other steps? Step one is lifestyle changes. Okay. And step two, well, step one is getting the bad stuff out. Okay. Step two is adding the good stuff back. Right. Okay. So, bad stuff out, good stuff in. That's, that's a pretty right. simple formula. Bad stuff out, good stuff in. Right. Step three is working on the foundational issues which are reflexes and structural issues. Many of these kids had traumatic births. So their body structure is screwed up. And they need work by a chiropractor or an osteopath or somebody who does reflex integration to get the organs and the, the system integrity back in the way it should be. If a child had a had a C-set, was born by C-section, for instance, that would affect his body's reflexes and their ability to promote his development. Is that common and thing? And then the third step is to, fourth step is to work on the sensory issues. And finally, we start to work on the, the last issues, which are talking and relating, the communication and um, social skills, which is where most people start, unfortunately. They was, work at the end product skills without going back to the foundations for those skills. Yeah, I was going to say that the traditional system that I understood is pretty much just the last step in, in, in your That's system. Right. So, uh, That's right. That's right. The very end of the book talks about prevention. So the, okay. the subtitle of that book, Outsmarting Autism, is Management, Healing, and Prevention of Autism Spectrum Disorders. Okay. So in my last chapter, I talk about the future and how we, we can get to young mothers, even preconception, and prevent autism. So not only is autism healable in many cases, and not all, and, but it is also preventable because we know what the risk factors are. It's, um, is C-section, uh, uh, kids from C-sections commonly have developmental problems? Yes. Well, that's interesting. Because you, your body is programmed with over a hundred different reflexes. And those reflexes are in there for the sole purpose of getting the child from helpless and motorically unable to do anything to being able to get up and sit up and crawl and eventually walk to be ambulatory and yeah. to be upright. And that happens in 12 months. It's very magical. And those reflexes develop in utero. A couple of those reflexes work in tandem to get that baby through the birth canal. So that is, the baby spirals down the birth canal and out, and that makes those reflexes active, and then they, they integrate. Wow. If the baby didn't do that, if you cut the mother open and pull out the baby, those reflexes stay in there, and they make mischief. Ah. And they interfere with development. But you so have we can, you have processes we can to get intervene rid of that. and, and yeah. help them become active even postpartum and help the baby develop. 
And once the reflexes become more integrated, then the higher developmental functions like talking and, uh, and eye gazing and listening can take place. This is fascinating. And, you know, you've, I've known you a long time, but you're really proving to me just how, uh, how in-depth and how detailed your knowledge on this subject is. So I really look, well, forward, to, uh, I really look forward to the book, and I wish you the best of success with it. The other thing I know we want to talk about is you uh, is the, the topic is vaccinations, and you've got an event coming up in September uh, that we want to promote and get people who are at all interested in this topic uh, to come out on September 12th at uh, Phipps Conservatory. That's a great place to do an event. Uh, $40 includes lunch, or $49. Um, let's talk about vaccines. Uh, this is a question that's, that's kind of bugging me. Are they still putting mercury in some or any of the vaccines that are currently being yes. made? Vax mercury is still in some of the flu vaccines. And if you talk to homeopaths, they will say that, that there are energetic traces of mercury in some lots of other vaccines that used to have mercury in them. Mm. Okay. Because what they did was they took those lots that had not expired and they removed the mercury, allegedly. So when you remove something, the energy of that something is still there. And so yeah. the big, there's, first of all, there's no subject on the planet that I know of that is more polarizing and more controversial than vaccination. I, I think I have to agree with you there. Yeah. And doctors don't want to talk to parents about it. Friends can get into fights that ruin lifelong friendships. Husbands and wives can fight over it to, and cause divorces. So this is extremely controversial, hot topic. And what made me be stupid enough to put on this this <laughs> symposium is that in one week I encountered three incidents of doctors who refused to talk about to their patients and um, there was all kinds of negative stuff going on on the internet about anti-vaxxers who were causing measles and polio and all kinds of stuff to come back. Right. Well, uh, Jenny McCartney. Yeah, it is disheartening. And there's a lot of facts that are twisted and turned about vaccines and their relationship to autism. And initially, a lot of people thought that vaccines caused autism. And if vaccines caused autism, every child in America would be autistic. Right. But from what we talked about earlier and total load, and our genetic propensity and MTHFR, we now know that vaccines are dangerous because of not only the pathogens, but what's called the adjuvants or the additives that are put in vaccines for some children. Mm -hmm. And for some, these children who cannot detoxify easily, these adjuvants add up and become part of the child's total load. Okay. And since the body's number one priority is staying well, this child's body is so totally focused on trying to detoxify that the child cannot focus on someone or something outside. Yeah. And so it disrupts their ability to focus and to be social and smile and pay attention and listen and do all the things that we want them to do. And person after person in the autism community will tell you that they had a child who was developing fairly normally. And then the child had a number of vaccines on a given day and the child disappeared. Right. So for me, that vaccine or those series of vaccines were the straw that broke the camel's back in a child who was already immune compromised. And many of these kids had all these risk factors prior to that incident. They had asthma, they had allergies, they had reflux, they had eczema, they have all different kinds of immune um, red flags 
that were there before they got the shot. And the problem with our, our medical program is that we have a one-size-fits-all vaccination program. And the American Academy of Pediatrics tells you that on your three-month checkup, you have these shots, and on your six-month checkup, you have those shots, and on your nine-month checkup and your year-old checkup, you have these shots. And even preemie babies that are under five pounds often have the same shot schedule as robust full-term babies. Mm. And that's like you and me trying to fit into the same pair of shoes. It just doesn't work. And we need to have an individualized vaccination schedule. Right. So, I, I was going to say that like, it, it seems to me that there's some real good things that have happened uh, because of vaccinations. I mean, we don't have polio by, by and large because of vaccinations. So it's not well, part that's, of the, that's arguable too. Well, uh, but, but I mean, my point is that we, besides the one size fits all, I think what a lot of modern medicine does is say it's either black or white, and they don't allow right. for any color gray or you know color in between. And as you said, we need a personalized vaccination right. schedule. So, so now that we have a genetic ability to look at your your individualized genome, right, we are going toward personal medicine where individuals can personalize with their doctor what is the right medicine for them, the right dosages, the right nutrients, the right diets, the right vaccination schedule. And hopefully this is going to come out in the next hope, five to ten years wow. before some of, we get more and more kids with autism. Well, and this also, I would think, it requires the, the medical established by and large to accept the concept of detoxing and to get past, I mean, detoxing is now a big trend and a buzzword and fad and, you know, right. all the Hollywood starlets are detoxing, so I want to do it too. <laughs> I mean, you know, detoxing is a function of several parts of the human body. As you said, we pee, right. we poop, we sweat. Uh, I, I didn't know the toxins came out in our hair. That's a new one for me. Um, well, the hair analysis is one of the the key ways uh, of and the least of invasive way of looking at your ability to detox. And how much? One of the class one of the classic studies done on kids with autism was to do a hair analysis with kids with autism and their typical siblings. Now, this is a trick question. Hmm. Which which kid, the kid with autism or his typical sibling, had mercury in his hair? I won't embarrass you. Okay. With the wrong... <laughs> both. I'll say both. I'll say both. What? I'll say both. No. No. Not both. The one the, the without it. The typical sibling had mercury in his hair because it was coming out. The kid with autism had no mercury in his hair. So it wasn't coming so out. So why? Does that mean he didn't have any inside him? No. It meant his body wasn't detoxifying. And even the scientists who did this study were very surprised hmm. that the kids with autism had no mercury in their hair. So they did what was called a challenge test. And they gave them a substance which forced the mercury to come out. And it poured out when they, it looked at initially like they didn't have any. But when they gave them a substance that attached itself to the mercury, in three months when they looked at the hair again, they had tons of mercury in their hair. And not only did they have more mercury in their hair than they did it initially, but the kids were physically more developmentally appropriate. They were talking, they were relating, they were developmentally closer to age as we took off this total load factor from their body. Wow, wow. It's a big wow. It's a big wow. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a fascinating topic. Uh, Patty, I I'm, I'm really appreciate you coming on our podcast today. Um, I want to well, wish you. I appreciate you you're letting me blab on and on <laughs> about one of my most passionately favorite subjects. Well, you really are the 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 uh, 
most uh, knowledgeable person I know on this subject. So I, I'm really happy to have you on. I wish you the very best with the book. I can't wait to read it and uh, we'll get it. Uh, well, thank you. It's, it's on Amazon now, right. just as an e-book. And in two weeks, it's going to, and you can pre order it as the hardcover book. It's over 500 pages. Wow, it, 500 pages. Yep. And the very best part, the part that I love, love, love the most is the index. And the index is extraordinary. I had a wonderful indexer, and she had the ability to have you look up anything you want in the index and I challenge you to find something that's not listed in the index that you're interested in. And then I just want to say one more thing about the vaccination conference, sure. which is that we're very lucky to have a wonderful keynote speaker who is Barbara Lowe Fisher, my very good friend, who is the founder of the National Vaccine Information Center. And Barbara founded that center in the late 80s when her son was vaccine damaged by the DPT shot, and she wrote the book DPT, A Shot in the Dark, which has become a classic. And so Barbara has never been to Pittsburgh to speak, and we're very excited to have her, and a lot of people know her, and she's been a very staunch speaker of vaccine education, and that's what this conference is all about. It is not an anti-vaccine conference, and I will argue with people who say that it's going to be. It's a vaccination conversation. Okay. We hope to have regular medical professionals come. We want to hear both sides. Um, I might have to have security there, but <laughs> I, I'm prepared to do that. Um, I, I've, I've done that before when I've put on controversial subjects, but right. we want to be able to educate people about the the whole vaccine issue so that we can stop hating each other for right. being one end of the pole or the other. And, and I think it's a real important point to say that, you know, this generates a lot of heat and anger and discontent and everything, but you really are backed up by the facts. You don't put anything out there unless you have the science to back it up. Am I right? That's right. And my book is meticulously researched. Okay. It has the latest research in it. I, I was forced to write the second book. I thought I was done when I wrote Envisioning a Bright Future in 08. But we, we have more information in the last five years than we had for the whole previous hundreds of years about autism because of our technology and our ability to, to figure out what's going on in the human body. And it's a very exciting time. And... The parents are the ones who have been pit bulls and figuring out what's going on because they are trying to get their kids back. Yeah, yeah. Well, good on you, and God bless all your work. It's uh, it's wonderful, wonderful work. Thank and, you uh, very much, and thank you for what you're doing, Sven. You bet. I really appreciate this opportunity. Oh, you bet. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll get this video out to you, and we'll, we'll spread the word far and wide. I think this is uh, this wonderful. is real important work. And, and like you say, it's okay. because of we've got all the science now. We know about the guts and the and the serotonin's made in the guts, and we we have all the science to back it up. So that's awesome, Pat uh, Patricia Lemmer, author of Outsmarting Autism, and uh, going to be hosting a vaccination conference, uh, a conversation, I should say, on September twelfth. So once again, thanks for being with us, Patty. And you you can go on Eventbrite. Okay. And you can sign up for that conference. Great. If you just put in Pittsburgh in the, um, the location and then vaccination in the subject, it comes right up and you can sign up on right on Eventbrite. And you can also go on Facebook and you can like my book. Great. It has its own Facebook page. And so does Vaccination a Conversation have its own Facebook page. Awesome. Thanks to my techies who figured out how to make that happen. <laughs> well, we, we got good techies on our camp too, so we'll, we'll put I all those links. I'm very impressed <laughs> with this Google Hangout, which I never knew even existed well, and got me working on it. So there you go. And now, I'm, I'm now 
I'm now a 21st century techie. There you go. And now when, when uh, all those uh, world famous uh, journalists come and, and uh, want to talk to you, you can talk to them on a Google Hangout. So. Wonderful. And you can say you thank did it here you. first. So, thank you, Patty. <laughs> Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So once again, uh, a local person who is uh, world famous um, and doing great work around the world. And we didn't even get into talking about her work in Bahrain, which is really fascinating. So maybe next time, uh, Patricia Limmer is always such a great pleasure. Um, another uh, person of interest in Pittsburgh who's doing great work is uh, Joe uh, Veneri. I think that's the way it's spelled, it's pronounced. Joe is the uh, producer of Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh just today had its first pop-up wellness expo in Market Square. And I had a chance to talk with Joe about what's going on. Let's take a listen. We're here with Joe Veneri with the uh, pop-up wellness fair. What the heck's going on here today at Market Square? Yeah, uh, Pittsburgh, yeah, getfitpgh.com. We're doing, we're tr kind of trying to assemble the, you know, different health and wellness resources, uh, gyms, people, businesses, trying to make Pittsburgh a healthier place to live. So what better way to do that than put them all in one place and kind of connect the dots between, you know, all the healthy living resources in town. This is a great idea. Yeah. I mean, it looks like you've had a great turnout today. Yeah, we have 40 vendors. There's probably been a couple thousand people through the square today. So yeah. we're really excited about the turnout and uh, looking to August, September to start turning out a monthly event. That's awesome. Yeah. You have a nice mix of vendors too. You have organizations, you have uh, private uh, companies, yeah. you have the library yeah. here. You have some great yoga going on. Yeah, well, we say you can't have uh, a strong community unless it's a healthy community. So there's a lot of different pieces that go into that. And we focus on food, farms, fitness, and you know, knowledge, education, certainly at the library. There's a lot of things you can learn to integrate into your healthy lifestyle that people might not commonly associate with health and fitness. So we, we try to cover it all. We don't really define health for people. We let them figure it out for themselves. Great. And tell us a little bit about your organization, Fit Pittsburgh. Yeah, uh, Pittsburgh. Get Pittsburgh. Fit, yeah, GetFitPGH.com is Pittsburgh's guide to healthy living. So we have a website, uh, different social media platforms, and then we host community events to bring people together around health. So we're awesome. like the marketing platform for all the people, smaller farms, businesses, gyms that don't have a marketing budget. So that's it for this week and the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine uh, weekly podcast. It is the uh, heat of summer happening, so get out there and get outside. Uh, if you're not outside, though, check us out on Facebook, uh, where we promise 100% uh, cat-free, no videos of cats. Uh, I don't know why I put that in there, but uh, just do. And uh, join us here every Tuesday at 4 o'clock uh, for the live version, and watch for us on YouTube, iTunes, Speaker, and Stitcher. Um, also, uh, we want to make sure if you are a professional that you do join up our meetup group, the Integrated Medicine Professionals Meetup. We've got uh, several things that are going to be happening in August um, and we want to make sure you know about them. It's going to be some real nice opportunities to mingle and get to know some of the other professionals in our area. So make sure you take a peek out for that. And until next time, yens be careful out there.